I'm sure most, if not all of us here this morning, will be familiar with the story of the Israelites being rescued by God from their slavery in Egypt. The arrival of Moses, the ten plagues, the, the, the fleeing through the dried up Red Sea, this is the stuff of many a Sunday school curriculum since writing has been invented. Indeed, modern culture has been fascinated also by this story. Right from the 1956 film, The Ten Commandments, that great epic, is it Charlton Heston? Through uh, the, the 90s, 1998, the animated Prince of Egypt, uh, and finally uh, Ridley Scott's epic 2014 film, Exodus, Gods and Kings. Not very biblical, but great CGI, so if you're interested. But somehow I think the, the very fact that this story is familiar to us it means that we, th- we think we know what it's saying. And sometimes familiar stories uh, bear re- uh, another look. This narrative is important, and God wants us to remember it and learn from it. So this morning we're thinking about the people of Israel camped at the Mount of Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai there. And we're going to seek God's help to learn lessons from chapter 32 of Exodus. And there are four lessons for us. And here is lesson number one. Waiting on God is hard. Waiting on God is hard. Now, we're going to be thinking a little bit about the difficulties of waiting on God in prayer tonight. So uh, there's a trailer for you for tonight's sermon. Don't miss that. But here we're thinking more about the general challenge of faith. And and this is the observation, which I think is really pretty obvious from our text. You don't need to be a Greek or a Hebrew theologian or a great uh, school, um, uh, a great pupil of of Scripture to realize from our reading this morning that waiting on God is hard. So the people of Israel fleeing slavery from Egypt, have demonstrated time and time again that they have fickle hearts. Let's do a quick summary of events for you. Um, They were released by Pharaoh, finally after the plagues finished in chapter 12. And they had, as you know, that pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day to guide them, that's chapter 13, and and by the time we get to chapter 14, they're afraid and and grumbling. They've got their backs to the sea, and before them is the assembled army of Egypt, full of chariots and horses. A chariot in its day was was the main battle tank. You didn't stand much chance as a foot soldier against a chariot. The people are outgunned and cornered. Um, But rather than um, remembering that amazing deliverance when Moses parts the Red Sea and they go across and God destroys their enemies, they fear and they complain to Moses that he's brought them out into the wilderness to die. Remember the cucumbers of Egypt? (laughs) Despite that miraculous rescue and the hymn of praise that they sing in, in, in verse chapter 15. It only takes them three more days into the journey into the, into the wilderness before they are again grumbling in chapter 15, verse 24, that time because of lack of water. And then fast forward to chapter 16, and it's just it's the same old story, rinse and repeat. In chapter 16, they're complaining about being hungry. God feeds them with quails and with manna. But guess what? Chapter 17, they're grumbling again about being thirsty. They're not acquitting themselves well. They are forgetting very, very easily the blessings of the Lord. And they are very quick and eager to listen to their rumbling stomachs. And we think, people of Israel, we wouldn't have done that. You've just had a miraculous passage through the Red Sea. How amazing would that have been? Surely you remember those walls of water. What on earth are you doing grumbling? We wouldn't have grumbled. Oh, no. Oh, no. We wouldn't have grumbled. Do you recognize your heart there? Are you good at looking at the problems of other people and judging them for it? 
thinking in your, if you were in their situation, you wouldn't grumble. I, I think we're all susceptible to looking down our noses at other people who are grumbling. But wait. Are you telling me that you've never grumbled against God? That you've never thought his plan for your life was less than perfect? You've never, ever complained about an illness or a physical problem or wondered where God was in a chaotic relationship? You've never prayed for a family member or friend and you're still waiting for God to save them? You've never doubted God's provision for you in a time of unemployment or wondered where his blessing is when money is tight and that unexpected bill arrives? We're good at judging other people, but we quickly give ourselves a free pass because, well, our situation always justifies our grumbling, doesn't it? We're always self, self-accepting self of our situation. Do we grumble any less than the children of Israel did? I think not. And if they were here today witnessing our experience, they might well point out that they only had a pillar of fire and cloud to show them God's presence. Whereas we have the crucified and risen Lord Jesus and all of the New Testament teaching to help us through our struggles of faith. Surely we've got more reason to trust God than ever they had. And yet we still grumble. Just as you all might hear a great sermon on a Sunday, but by Wednesday or Thursday, we're already complaining about the providence of a hard week. So the people here in chapter 32, well, they're already getting bored of waiting. 40 days and 40 nights, that's all they had to wait. No matter that they'd heard God speak his commandments in chapter 20, They'd seen the cloud and heard the thunder on the mountain. They'd willingly entered into that covenant in chapter 24, promising obedience in all that God had said they were to do. Nobody twisted their arms behind their back when they promised to obey him. Some of their young men had sacrificed oxen to the Lord, and 70 of their elders had met with the living God himself on the mountain, on a sapphire pavement that looked like the very substance of heaven itself. I don't know whether you saw the Northern Lights on Friday night. Even if you missed them, you can't miss the coverage on social media or, or on, even on the news, can you? Such was the beauty of this natural phenomenon. And yet the Northern Lights would have paled into significance to the glory that those 70 elders saw as they ate and drank in God's presence on a sapphire pavement. Wow! What an experience. And still that is not enough to keep the people from being unfaithful to God. Here in chapter 32, verse 1, they are starting to wonder if Moses is ever coming back. It's only taken 40 days and they've already given up on him. Sure, they haven't had the privilege of reading chapters 25 to 31. That was Moses up on the mountaintop communing with God. But they're camped at the bottom of the mountain, ignorant of these chapters, and they're waiting. And they're waiting. And they're waiting. We don't like waiting, do we? Especially when we don't know what the time frame is in advance. We live in an instant age. We want everything now. And so we're quick to write God's plans off, regardless of how much previous revelation we've seen of him. Beware of spiritual complacency. Beware of taking your faith for granted. God's timescales are not our timescales. Why are we so quick to, to, to disbelieve when God doesn't answer our prayers, when God doesn't change our situations? within the time frame that we demand. Why do we even think we can dictate to God the timings? So watch your heart and learn patience with God, especially when he walks you through 
times of trial and testing. He often teaches us important lessons through hard providences, through months and years rather than minutes and hours. See the grievous sin that the people fell into because they got bored of waiting for God. And see how easily your heart would do the same. Waiting on God is hard, but we must learn patience and keep the faith. That's lesson number one, waiting on God is hard. Lesson number two, leading God's people is hard. Leading God's people is hard. So Moses and Joshua are still away up the mountain of the Lord whilst these people are hatching their plan to replace Moses. And we saw, didn't we, from chapter 24, uh, that after their amazing experience dining with God on this sapphire stone pavement, Moses and Joshua went further up the mountain. Indeed, Moses goes all the way to the top to meet with God himself. And, and 24 verse 14 tells us that Moses explicitly tells the others that they are to wait with the people, and indeed Aaron and Hur are appointed as the go-to people for any issues that the people might have. They're kind of their standing deputy leader, if you like. And off goes Moses, drops off Joshua a bit further up, and Moses himself goes up for his 40 days and his 40 nights. And so back down in the, in the camp, here is Aaron. Remember, he's just dined with the living God himself on a sapphire pavement that looks like heaven. And Aaron's in charge. And Aaron was a an appropriate person to lead God's people, to be a deputy leader. He was appointed by God to be Moses' mouthpiece before Pharaoh, if you remember that, when Moses complained to God that I'm not a good enough speaker, I get tongue-tied. And all through the plagues, all through the subsequent Red Sea experience, Aaron was there. He's Moses' brother, remember. He's right by his side as, as Moses leads the people. And he shortly to be appointed as the head of the priestly line, which is a really important office. So Aaron's credentials are pucker. He's he's the right man for the job. He's the natural person to assume the authority of leader in Moses' short absence. Unfortunately, Aaron fails spectacularly in his responsibilities. Aaron comes to understand that it is spectacularly hard to lead God's people. Here, look, they come to Aaron, their standing leader, and they ask him, Aaron, make us gods who will go before us because their working assumption is that Moses is either dead on the mountaintop or he's, he's done a bunk, he's scarpered and he's not coming back. He stranded them in this desert area. They're left in the lurch now. What, what are we going to do without Moses? Let's, let's have some standing gods. Aaron, make us some. The sense of their gathering around it suggests that Aaron is, is intimidated. Perhaps we might even say bullied by them. Aaron is certainly aware that there are significant numbers of people here. And, and it's, it's one man against all the people. And they're very forceful. Indeed, we can tell from the way that they speak of Moses that they have tones of contempt and dismissal. So this is really quite a forceful message they bring to Aaron. The pressure is on when Aaron faces the people here. How's he going to respond? Verse 2 has Aaron's response. And Aaron is instantly accommodating and complicit with their desires. He totally caves to the people's sinful desires. Where's the counter-argument? Where's the restating of the first and second commandments that they heard a few chapters before? Where's the negotiated pause while he inquires of God how to deal with the situation? It's all missing. Aaron, quite probably frightened for his life, has let the fear of men override his responsibilities as a representative of God. 
And look, Aaron's failure is not just the sin of the idol creation, which is spelled out for us here in details between verses 2 and 4, but the way that Aaron tries to explain away the existence of the golden calf. When Moses tipped off by God, remember, God is omniscient. God knows all things. He knows what the people are doing. When Moses, tipped off by God to the sinful rebellion of the people, returns from the mountain, he, he questions Aaron about the calf. Look there in verses 21 to 24 of chapter 32. Does Aaron fess up to his part of the plot? Does he own up to his sin? No. He's playing the victim. He tries to pass off responsibility to the people. I had no choice, Moses. They made me do it. You, you know what they're like. And look, in, in verse 24, he pretends that he simply threw the gold into the fire. <laughs> Out came this calf. We know this to be false because the details of his forming work has already been expressly told us in, chap- in, in verses 3 and 4. Aaron has sinned. And when he's called out about his sin, I don't know how your heart responds when you're called out to sin, but just like my heart does, Aaron's making excuses. He's trying to wriggle out of owning his sin. Do you do that? when you're confronted with your sin? In doing so, he incurs the significant wrath, not just of Moses, but also of the Lord himself. When Moses retells this story after the wilderness wanderings in Deuteronomy chapter 9, in chapter 9, verse 20, he tells the people that the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him were it not for his intercession. So don't misunderstand here. Moses is angry at Aaron, but God is even angrier and would have destroyed him for his sin. Aaron failed the people and he failed the Lord. He caved when he should have been strong. He muddied the waters when he should have come clean. He let his human frailty, his fear of men, overpower his calling. Leading people is hard. Leading God's people is especially hard. People, I'm going to tell you something that you should already know by now. Your leaders are sinners, just like you. They are sometimes confronted with fears and worries and need to be strong in the face of such things. It is often hard and unpopular to resist the sins of people, It's difficult to call out sin, to stay strong in the face of people who want to compromise. To do so can be very costly in personal relationships. They need good people management skills. They need wisdom and discretion. They need strong faith and conviction in their calling. They need an iron grip on Jesus to fear God more than they fear men. They need fortitude and diligence in the face of spiritual attack. They need to be gentle with sheep and brave with wolves. And you see that leaders like that are rare and precious. You have a responsibility to your leaders. Don't treat them like the people treated Aaron. Don't enlist them in your sinful schemes. You are to obey them in the Lord, Hebrews 13, 17. Reflect on Aaron's failure. And please leave here today with a newfound respect for your spiritual leaders. Resolve to pray regularly and fervently for Simon, for Chris, for Andrew, that they will be strong when you need them to be, especially when they are dealing with your sin. Pray that they will be braver and more faithful than Aaron was here. Leading God's people is hard. Here's 
lesson number three. Leading God's, sorry, judgment on sin is hard. Judgment on sin is hard. They don't teach verses 27 to 29 in Sunday school. But the consequences of sinning against the Lord is severe. Moses drives the action, 25 to 26, gathering the faithful Levites to his side. Let's read at verse 27. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion and every man his neighbour. Don't skip lightly through the words of that verse. Stop a moment and dwell on it. Some of God's people are called on to judge others of God's people. This is brutal. This is chilling. And this is vital. Because it shows us sin from God's perspective. It helps us understand the seriousness with which God must treat sin. Sin is always offensive to a holy God. And he will always punish it. Here, the judgment is with a sword and ends their lives. Thankfully, the Lord doesn't call you to literally bear the sword. But God does call you to exercise similar accountability over your sinning brother and sister. I'm hoping Matthew 18, 15 to 17 is already familiar to you regarding church discipline. It's the basis on pretty much every church handbook that has a church discipline section. But look, church discipline doesn't have to be formal for it to be effective. In fact, better if it isn't. Church discipline should be informal before it becomes formal. Let me read you Galatians 6, 1 to 2. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Or James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Again, This will not always, perhaps it will never be easy. Easy is to overlook, to ignore, to explain away the sin of your fellow church member. But but that's not love, is it? To love is to rebuke with great care and gentleness and much prayer. Are you allowing sin within the body of your church membership. Let's be brave and bold and loving and gentle with each other as we seek to purify the church of Jesus Christ together. When the Levites brought the sword of judgment for sin, about 3,000 of the people fell that day. God is not casual about sin. He hates it, and he will root it out from amongst his people. We must learn not to be casual about our sin either, because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. Waiting on God is hard. Leading God's people is hard. Judgment on sin is hard. And here's our fourth and final lesson this morning. We need an atonement. We need an atonement. Look, the sin has been punished. 
But the people remain sinners. Sinners have a habit of sinning. We're addicted to it, much like a heroin addict who has a chemical dependency on the drug. Moses understood this. Here he is, look, verse 30. He's on, this is the morning after the night before, as the stench of 3,000 corpses starts to fill the camp. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. We can learn much from Moses here. He sees the need to acknowledge sin. He realizes that sinners will struggle in relationship with God unless that sin is is covered, is atoned for. And he realizes that there is a need for one to mediate between God and men about their sin, to intercede on their behalf. Therefore, in verse 31, Moses sets off to do just that, to speak with the living God about the sin of his people. He begs God for forgiveness. He even offers to be the one who receives the punishment on their behalf, verse 32. As mediator of the covenant of law, here Moses is so very clearly and obviously pointing us to the person and work of the Lord Jesus. But sadly, Moses ultimately could not be the one who stood in their place and bore their sin. The consequences of their sins will be visited upon them, verse 33, says God. Moses is insufficient to atone for the sins of the people. He is unable to bear the wrath of God against that sin. Atonement cannot be achieved under the law. That's what we're learning here. The covenant of law, Moses of whom was the mediator, it cannot make us right with God. It is impossible for any of us to be saved by relying on the covenant of law. It is designed not for our salvation, but to show you your sin. We are unable to achieve salvation by law. Rather, it points us forward to a better offering, not to the sacrifice of sheep and goats and oxen, but of the very Lamb of God himself. Jesus is the high priest who offered atonement for the sins of God's people. Unlike Aaron, a sinner who failed to uphold God's righteousness, Jesus is sinless and pure and did not turn his face away from the task before him. Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah, he is able to be an advocate for us with the Father. He, unlike Moses, can indeed offer his sinless life of perfect service to God as an atonement for our sin. He can be a propitiation for our sin to turn aside God's wrath. He can reconcile us to God so that we can again be welcomed into God's family and be called sons of the Most High. Is that you this morning? Have you realised your sins are weighty and serious? That they are an offence against the holy, righteous, living God? Have you realised that your actions, your obedience can never, ever make up for your sin? That your sin deserves punishment and death just as surely as the Israelites that were felled by the Levite sword on that fearful day at the Mount Sinai? Have you realised you need a mediator, one who will intercede with Almighty God on your behalf? And look, Moses is long gone, and in any case, as we've seen, inadequate. No, you need the better Moses, the new and better covenant based on better promises, mediated by a better high priest 
and sealed with a better sacrifice. You need Jesus. Have you found him? Have you come to him for that forgiveness and for that eternal life? Even as we're seeing the covenant of law here given on Mount Sinai, even in this text there is a hint here for us of this new and better covenant. Look at verse 34. I bet you missed this in the reading. See that God tells Moses that he will send his angel before the people. The angel of the Lord was present with the people. We've already learned, if you read the text carefully enough, present in the pillar of cloud and fire. But here we're told he explicitly walks before the people, leading them into the promised land. Here is God, the second person of the Trinity, present with his people. One of a number of times we meet him in the Old Testament. The technical name for this is a theophany or a Christophany, a bodily appearance of the second person of the Trinity, pre his incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth. And this is a wonderful truth for us to hold on to. God, present with his rebellious, sinful people, leading them into the promised rest. For them, that was the land of Canaan. For us, as New Testament Christians, it is the new heavens and the new earth where God will dwell with his people forever. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant of the better promises. How does he do that? Dare we read verse 34 in the context of verse 33 and perhaps see through the mist and the fog a vague outline of Golgotha, of the face of the skull. Have you seen Jesus hanging on a tree Cursed by God, carrying the punishment for your sin in the wounds on his back. Here is a glimpse of everything you need. Look to Jesus, this better sacrifice, the covering that you need for your sin, and cast yourself upon him.